Hello everybody. Welcome to my PowerPoint presentation on EKG basics and rhythm recognition. My name is Nicholas Garcia. So by the end of this lesson, my hope is that you'll have a better understanding of the basic components of an EKG, how to count a rhythm, and, and, and how to apply a five-step process to EKG recognition. In doing so, you'll be able to identify the um, the very classic rhythms and arrhythmias, um, all of which I've listed here. Now, there's there's a there's tons more beyond this. However, for testing purposes, these will be the ones that will be on there, and you will have uh, five to six of them that you're going to have to recognize. Okay, on that test, rather five to seven, I believe. There's some terms that I want you to get familiar with. Uh, depolarization, or the stimulation of the different chambers of the heart and heart muscle. This represents really contraction of those structures. Repolarization, or depolarization again, I just want to piggyback on that and say the contraction to eject that blood to the next phase of that cardiac cycle. Uh, repolarization is the resting of those cardiac structures, which essentially will allow for refilling of blood. The SA node or sinoatrial node is the ideal pacemaker, or the principal pacemaker of the heart, and it fires at a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. The AV node is the backup pacemaker of the heart, and that fires at a range of 40 to 60 beats per minute. Th these are important. These are important to remember because as we look more at rhythms and the rate you'll know maybe where it's firing from based on on the rate alone some other terms that aren't listed here but i'd like you to know are sinus um, atrial junctional uh, tachycardia bradycardia arrhythmia dysrhythmia okay So let's talk about the basic structures of the electrical activity that the EKG captures. Uh, the first thing is the P wave. The P wave is usually rounded, and it's the uh, little hump right before the QRS complex. And what it represents is atrial depolarization, or the contraction or stimulation of the atrial chambers, right and left. And again, those after those uh, after the uh, superior and inferior venous cava have brought blood back from uh, the body system and, and emptied it into the right chamber of the heart, the right atrium, uh, that right atrium will depolarize, as will the left side, simultaneously. And that will that, that contraction will cause it to go into the next phase of that cardiac cycle. The PR interval is represents the atrial depolarization moving towards ventricular depolarization so basically at the beginning that it ends at the beginning of that ventricular depolarization or ventricular contraction. The QRS complex is the most recognizable part of that component. And it's the tall wave, that little squiggly tall wave wedged in between the P and the T wave. One thing to note about the QRS complex is that even though it's always called a QRS complex, sometimes it doesn't contain a Q or an S. Okay, but it always, always, always will contain an R. The ST segment is the end of ventricular depolarization, or the end of ventricular contraction. The T wave is late ventricular repolarization, or late ventricular relaxation. So this, is, this relaxation state allows for the refilling of the ventricles. So each heartbeat, ideally, again, should contain a PQRST sequence. So first things first, we have to take a look at the EKG paper that these uh, electrical impulses are being burned onto. EKG or ECG, ECG are synonymous terms. Uh, EKG is still very common, although it really doesn't hold any uh, real significance because um, the K part of it really is, uh, you know, has to do with the German scientists that developed this, and uh, in German, cardio is uh, spelt with a K. Well, in English, it's with a C, so ECG is just as common and probably more relevant for us. Well, 
first things first, we have to look at the the what the little boxes and big boxes mean on the EKG paper. And let me just pull up a little pencil here, a little marker, to basically say that these are little boxes. And each little box equates to 0 0.04 seconds. Now five of these boxes equates to 0.2 seconds, okay? And so again, these are little boxes. And these are big boxes, okay? So five by five boxes are, are considered big boxes. So when I refer to it later as big boxes, you know that it's this five by five area right here. And if it's a little box, I mean this here. All right. Um, oh, one thing to note is that for testing purposes, all the rhythm strips that will be on the test will be assumed that they are six second strips. Now, if you ever confuse and ever want to know for sure if it's a six second strip, all you have to know is that a six second strip will be in length from left to right 30 of these large boxes. Okay. And that makes sense because 30 times 0.2 seconds is six seconds. Let me erase this real quick. All right, so so let's look at this structure that we just talked about, the atrial depolarization. Um, that, again, is the P wave. And let me just, again, grab my little magic marker here. And so the P wave is from here to here, okay? And again, what this represents is atrial depolarization or atrial contraction and it, and it happens simultaneously the left and the right contract at the same time and that's important to remember okay so when I when we, we say here baseline to baseline that's what it means it means this point here to this point here okay the normal duration of a P wave is 0 0.12 seconds or 0 0.12 seconds okay Now let's look at the PR interval. And remember, again, we, we said that the PR interval basically encompasses the contraction of the atrium and goes all the way to the beginning of the ventricular contraction or ventricular depolarization. So let's pull out our magic marker one more time so we can take a look at what's going on here. So I just want to show you here and on this highlighted purple here there's this is the beginning of the P and here is the beginning of the QRS right here so that's the PR interval and it should be uh, 12 point 12 to point 0.2 seconds okay now there's something else that I want to establish while we're here this right here this line here is called the isoelectric line. Iso means same, same electric line. So what happens is there's deflections because of the electrical activity of the heart and the EKG machine captures these deflections, okay? So this is a positive deflection, the P wave, okay? And this, let me draw that isoelectric line one more time. In the first negative deflection, the first negative deflection below this isoelectric line is a Q. Okay? And so the Q starts from the isoelectric line, beginning for the first part of its depolarization, or rather deflection, and then it stops right here at the isoelectric line. So this is the Q right here, okay? As we're going to see later, not every QRS complex contains a Q. Now the R starts at this isoelectric line here, and it's the first positive 
inflection, okay, after the P wave. So it goes up here and down, and then it stops at this isoelectric line. The S wave is the one that follows the R, and it's a negative deflection underneath the isoelectric line, okay? So again, we have our Q, R, S, okay? And the T, where does the T start? Because as you can see that this kind of curves up, okay? And this is called a J line. Um, when this happens, all you have to do is kind of eyeball your isoelectric line again. And we can see that the isoelectric line ends or starts right here. So from this point, that's where the T wave starts and then ends. Okay. So moving on right here, we have uh, the QRS complex, which we just went over. Again, notating that the the Q sometimes isn't present. There's always there should always be some variation of R, and sometimes the S isn't present. But this is an ideal wave right here. Uh, there's the P, Q, R, S, and T. All right. The QRS is a ventricular depolarization. It's baseline to baseline. Okay, so where the first deflection is, right there, baseline, to right here, till it returns back to the, the isoelectric line. So that's it. And it should be 10 seconds or less, 0.10 seconds or less, excuse me. And if we start there, we see that it's one, uh, two and a half, probably two and a half um, small squares. So that would equate to about 10 seconds, okay? And just to show you, um, let me pull out my marker here, just to show you what we're talking about in terms of tying here. This is a P wave that starts here, okay? And it ends right about here, okay? And how many small squares do we have in there? We have one, two, three, okay? So maybe about three in between this phase so we're looking at and if we know that each small square equates to 0 0.04 seconds then three times 0 0.04 is 0.12 or 0.12 okay and that's within normal limits so the st segment the st segment begins again where the uh, what after the s or the r returns back to the isoelectric line here and it goes from the s all the way to the beginning of the t okay and normally it's flat uh, however like i said sometimes it follows a pattern like a j sort of like that all right so in doing that, all we have to do again is maybe, you know, just kind of mark out our isoelectric line and where that isoelectric line starts, that's where we're going to start counting from. All right. So it's the lat latter phase of ventricular repolarization or relaxation, relaxation, excuse me. Um, if we have peaked waves, peak T waves, it usually means hyperkalemia or uh, um, hyperpotassium, right? So this is kind of a T wave. It's not super peaked here, but if we look over here on this 12 lead, you see some of these real peak T waves, and that's a sign of hyperkalemia. Now the opposite, the inverted T waves, or a T wave that goes like this, would represent hypokalemia. So we got to follow the steps and the first step that we do is we determine the regularity of the R waves. Okay. Again, we remember the QRS complex 
goes something like this. So we got our P wave. First deflection is the Q, R, S, and T, right? So then it, you know, ideally this pattern continues and continues P, Q, R, S, T. Okay. So when we say regularity of the R wave, we mean what we're going to do is grab our calipers, okay, your metal calipers, or an easy thing to do is grab an index card, and you put the index card at the edge of that R wave, and then what you do is you make a little hash mark where the next one is, and what you do is you keep moving it over so you'll, you'll move this um, edge of the index card over to the next one and you see if it if it maps out from R to R and if it does within two to three small boxes that's the kind of that's the margin for error you have then it's normal it's regular it's regular from R to R okay so if the variation is less than 0.12 or again three small boxes then this, then it's regular. Uh, use the index card method or the calipers. You can also just use your fingers and go, you know, make a P sign from one tip of the R to the other tip of the R and just keep moving to the, each complex over and over to see if it maps out within, you know, three small boxes. Then it's, it's within normal and it's, it's a, that you have regularity of R we've established. So that's part one. The second step of this five-step process is to calculate the heart rate. The ventricular rate means counting R to R. Okay, and there's various methods to do this. Um, if it's uh, basically what we do, if it's irregular or regular, you can do the quick six-second method, which basically means you count all the R's within that six-second strip and you times it by ten. So if there's six uh, R's in that six second strip and you times it by 10, that's 60 beats per minute. Okay, roughly. All right. Now, if you use the boxes in between the R to R, the small ones, then you count the amount of small boxes between R to R peaks, you be it becomes more precise. Okay. What you would do there is, um, let's see. Let me just draw a quick little QRS complex right now. Uh, excuse my drawing here. QRS. T. P. Q. R. S. T. P. Q. R. S. T. Okay. So again, um, there's going to be little boxes in between here, okay? So let's just draw some boxes here. And these small boxes. All right, so in this instance, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven small boxes from the R to R, okay? So that means what we're going to do to determine what the rate of the rhythm is in this instance is we're going to take 1500 and divide it by seven, okay? And that would give us a rate of 214, which would be absolutely ridiculous, but it was just for the purpose of uh, showing you some imagery how that works, okay? The other way to do it is to count the big boxes, so the 5x5 five five boxes between them and divide it by 300. Um, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, what you want to do ideally is find an R wave that lands on the edge of a line, a solid line, and then count the number of large boxes, or ends on a solid line and count the number of small boxes. So if you're going to use the big box method, you're going to divide it, uh, the number of big boxes, or the 300 by the number of big boxes. And if you're using the small box method, you're going to take, um, 
1500 and divide it by however many small boxes there are. And so that's the, that's the ventricular rate, you guys. That's the ventricular rate. Now the atrial rate is P to P wave. Uh, this can be very different than the, than the ventricular rate. And you're like, why, how can that happen? But sometimes what happens is the heart in an irritable state will fire, continue to fire, um, from different portions of the heart, uh, superior to the, uh, AV node. And what will happen was, is the P waves will probably look different, but there will be more P waves than there are QRS complexes. So the, so believe it or not, the ventricular rate can be different than the atrial rate. But essentially you do the atrial rate the same exact way. You go to the peak of the, the atrial wave and you count the, um, number of, you just count the, um, P waves and times it by 10 or you, or you use the, uh, the small box method. Um, but typically you just, because of the irreg irregularity, you're finding an average. So that what you're going to do when it's irregular is just count the number of P waves, count the number of R waves. Okay. So that in that way you can find the ventricular and atrial rate. So, the third step in this process is to examine the P waves. Uh, there should be one before each QRS complex. All should look the same or very close. And they should all be within the, the, the parameters that we established, which a P wave, a P wave, uh, should be less than 0.12 seconds. Okay? And again, what is the P wave? But, atrial depolarization or atrial contraction okay the fourth step to this five-step process is to measure the pr interval the pr interval again what it represents is uh, the beginning of the p wave and the beginning of the qrs and what it represents again is uh, atrial depolarization and the beginning of ventricular depolarization so how do we measure it? We measure the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. All right, so let's just draw a little, a little method here, a little bit of imagery. So P, Q, R, S, T. All right, so again, it's the beginning let me just change the color real quick so we can differentiate here. It is the beginning of the P wave here to the beginning of the QRS complex. So where is the Q? The Q is the right where it starts to negatively deflect here. Okay. So we have here to here. Okay. And we determined, or we already talked about the PR interval being 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. So 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. All right. And this is important to know because what this will determine is whether it's firing from the SA node and then it's following the proper electrical pathway down. Um, what it will do is it'll stop at the, um, the junction, the AV junction, and it'll pause for a second to allow the, 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 atriums to fully contract and relax before the ventricle contract and relax and that's why we have the s1 s2 love dub sound doom 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 because um it delays it just enough so it doesn't depolarize at the same time the atrium and ventricle i mean okay the fifth and final method and, and just to let you know that, uh, this is a five step process in there. There are so many different aspects and, and layers to EKG recognition, but this is, this is the basic, uh, meat and potatoes, the bare bones, if you will. And this is what probably a nursing generalist should know on the telemetry floor. So basically you should be able to recognize if a, a rhythm is normal, uh, basic handful of classic arrhythmias and rhythms. 
as well as you should be able to recognize a potentially lethal or life-threatening rhythm so you know what to do in terms of calling a code and getting the um, code team in and getting the crash cart ready or starting CPR, establishing responsiveness, everything like that. Excuse me. So the, the fifth and final method of this five-step process is to measure the QRS complex. So again, the, the QRS complex, you're going to measure that by beginning at the QRS as it leaves the baseline to end of the QRS complete. So the first negative deflection, which is the Q, So P and then Q, negative deflection, R, positive deflection, S, and T. Okay, so where are we measuring? We're measuring from just that first point where it goes down off the electric uh, isoelectric line to the part where it comes up back up to the isoelectric line. So this is that, okay? And we know that the uh, QRS complex, the QRS complex should be uh, less than, uh, typically it's 0.04 to 10 seconds, but less than 10 seconds is a little easier to remember, okay? So what is 10 second, 0 0.10 seconds is um, two and a half small boxes, okay? So let's take a look at the first and uh, simplest rhythm strip, okay? And this is what we all want our hearts to be in because this will indicate that our heart is functioning at a normal rate and the way we want all of our hearts to function essentially means a healthy beating heart here. Um, the rhythm would be regular and what we mean by that as we march out, the first thing again is let's take a look at the most recognizable structures on the CKG and is it we have to uh, establish regularity between the R to the R okay so what we're going to do is we're going to grab our calipers and we're going to go boom and just keep going over and over with our calipaper or index card or calipers and just establish is it the same distance between each R give or take um, give or take two to three boxes, you know? And if it is, then we know that it's regular, okay? So right here, we have a red, regular rhythm because we've established the R to R here, okay? Um, it's within 60 to 100 beats per minute, all right? So, to, you know, ideally, we, we, we're thinking that this is being generated from the SA node or the principal pacemaker of the heart because we know that it fires at a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. We know that uh, normal vital signs would uh, state that our heart rate, a normal heart rate should be between 60 and 100. All right, and then, and then we have a P wave before each QRS complex. And they all look the same. They all take fairly the same shape, okay? And, And the P waves are uh, less than 12 seconds. So if we can count here, we have the beginning of this P wave. We have, you know, two boxes. So that's eight, uh, 0.08 seconds. And when I say less than uh, 12 seconds, I mean 0.12, of course. Two boxes is 0 0.04 times two is 0 0.08. Okay, so that's less than 0 0 0.10 seconds. All right, the PR interval, is it 0.12 to 20 seconds? Let's find out. Let's go over here. The beginning of the P, oops, sorry. The beginning of the P here to the first deflection off the isoelectric line here. Okay, so we're looking about maybe two and a half boxes if I could draw a straight line. Okay, which would be 0.12 seconds or 0.12 seconds. So yes, this is all within normal limits using our method, okay? We've, we've established regularity. Uh, we've, we've looked at our P waves. Um, the P waves are within 
are all the same shape and size, indicating that it's sinus or originating from the sinoatrial node or the SA node. Um, that there's a QRS complex that follows it. Um, there's a T wave repolarization or in, in, a, in a normal ST segment. Okay, so let's keep going here. The next thing we're going to look at is sinus tachycardia. So first thing that we see here is that the rhythm is regular if we were to mar march this out again with our calipapers or calipers. We'll see that um, R to R, that's the first thing we do. Step one, R to R, right? Okay, so we go to the R to R and we're, we're, we're looking at it and it's 100%, 100% that it's uh, within uh, two to three small boxes each one. Okay, and then next thing we're going to do, so let's just go sequentially. Step one, again, uh, recognize uh, R to R if it's regular, okay? Step two, what is the ventricular rate? Well, in this instance, we're just going to do the quick six-second count, and we have one, two, oops, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen times ten is 140. So it's not within the 60 to 100 uh, normal range. So we know that it's tacky. However, if we come over here and we see that there's a P wave, this is just one of those things where it's almost going to turn into a different rhythm because it's right, it's right on that cusp, but you can still see the P wave. It's almost hidden by the T, but it's still there and differentiate, you can still differentiate the, the P wave. Okay. You see that? So here's the T wave and here's the P wave and they're almost melted into each other, but you can still differentiate. So that's still, you can still see a P wave. They all look the same from uh, each structure. So we know that it's at 140 beats per minute. It's regular. It's tacky. Now I'm going to call it sinus because it, it has that P wave before that QRS complex, and they all look the same, okay? Now, we have to look at if the, is the QRS rhythm regular or irregular, okay? And we, we've already done that. Is the QRS width normal or prolonged? So what is our QRS? Um, it's got to be between 0.04 to 0.10 seconds, or less than 0.10 seconds. So we can count the small boxes here. So here's the, the Q right here to here. And we're looking at about two boxes. So we're looking at 0 0.08 seconds. So is that less than 10 seconds? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, is atrial activity present? Of course, when we say atrial activity, we mean, uh, you know, the firing of the P wave, first of all, in the PR interval. Okay. And we know, again, if we just keep repeating this, that the PR interval is going to be 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. And if you go to the beginning of the P to the beginning of the QRS, we're looking at 1, 2, 3, 4, probably small boxes. We're probably looking at just about 4. And of course, this is kind of eyeballing to any large degree, but 4 times 0 0.04 is 0.16 seconds. So that's still less than 0.20. Two, uh, two old seconds. So yes, it's still within normal limits. Okay. And, uh, you know, we, we want to consider how it, how the atrial activity is related to the ventricular activity. That means, you know, do they all seem to correlate the P to the QRS? You know, the, um, the atrial depolarization to the ventricular depolarization. And then, of course, repolarization. And it all seems to correlate. Okay, so basically what is this rhythm? And it's already written here. However, you should get used to knowing that it's sinus, first of all, because it has that P with the normal limits and they all look the same from each complex. And it's followed by a QRS. That's greater than 100 beats per minute, so then it becomes tachycardia. So it's sinus tachycardia.
The next one is sinus brady. And basically we're just going to repeat the same steps here. And I'm not going to go too far into it. But it is a, uh, a sinus rhythm because there's that P wave before each QRS complex. And it seems to correlate the PR intervals within normal limits. The um, QRS complex is less than 0.10 seconds. Again, the PR intervals uh, anywhere from 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. Um, again, the P waves are positively deflected and, you know, they all follow the same shape and pattern. The R to R looks even if you were to use your paper, index card, or fingers. And, uh, and it's a rate though. If we do the six second count, one, two, three, four R complexes in there. So if we do four times 10, it's 40. So we're looking at a rate of about 40 uh, beats per minute. So this would make it Brady, but because we've already um, entertained the, the structure of the P, we know it's generated most likely from the SA node. So we're going to call it sinus. All right. So now it's sinus bradycardia. Now let's look at one where the R to R is irregular. Okay. Now this is interesting because when that happens, it's it, it becomes an arrhythmia. Okay. And this is a uh, this can be not always disease process or a disease or irritable heart. Sometimes it means that they, it's a young individual. Uh, pediatrics are renowned for having a sinus arrhythmia. Excuse me. A sinus arrhythmia. Now what will happen? is that the heart will speed up when they exhale and then it'll slow down when you inhale. And if you think of that physiologically, you think when you're inhaling, you're bringing in oxygen so the heart doesn't have to work as hard. So of course it's gonna slow down. And then when um, you exhale, the, the heart's gonna require more oxygen. So then it's gonna speed up, okay? But first of all, let's go ahead and pull out our pen and let's look at this here so if i go like this this is pretty wide and then i go right here and i can already tell just by eyeballing even if i didn't have my calipers or calipaper that the this is much smaller than this okay so we know that these are different r to r's greater than our our allotted you know margin for error of three small boxes so in, in, in knowing this, we have to say already that it's irregular, okay? Irregular right away. Um, the rate, well, well, it's better just to do the six second uh, count method here. And I, I'm really a big fan of the six second method because it's quick um, when you're thinking on your feet and when you're the real time nurse, the frontline nurse, and you, and you tell the teletech to print you a strip because you, something's not sitting right with you. You can easily, without even mapping this out, see that from here to here to here, this is an irregular beat, okay? Um, with that being said, we have to look at the other components. So now we've established it's irregular, right? Let's count the rate. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, okay? So if we times that by 10. We're looking at a rate of about 80 beats per minute. Um, we might even check our atrial rate. So we count the P waves. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it also has an atrial rate of 80. Okay, because we're going to times that by 10. And then we're going to check for the components. First of all, is the P wave normal? P, how do we know if the P wave is normal? Well, it has to be less than 12 seconds in length. And it looks like we have from uh, baseline to baseline, we're looking at 1, 2, 3. 3 times 0 0.04 is 0.12. So that's normal. And there seems to be a P wave before each QRS complex that looks about the same, right? So we know that it's sinus because of that. Because the PR interval is within the normal limits, the P's all look the same. They're all positive, positively deflected up. So again, what are we assuming? That it's it's generating from the SA node. And then of course the QRX follows it and then the T wave. So we're 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 gonna say that it's sinus in that instance, okay? And 
Uh, so already it's irregular. It's sinus. It's at a, it's within the 60 to 100 beats per minute. The PR interval seems to be within normal limits. And the QRS complex is probably 10 seconds or less. So in, 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 uh, considering this, we know that it's going to be sinus arrhythmia. Okay. Sinus arrhythmia. Atrial flutter is another type of phenomenon where um, you have peaked upright P waves, irritable heart here. Uh, you can have an atrial rate. You're not going to, the P waves are going to appear sawtooth or like shark's fins, okay? And then you'll see a, a, a QRS complex. And there may be a, uh, like a, a repeating pattern. You know, there'll be four sawtooth structures, P waves before QRS. And if it's consistently like that, you'll say this is going to be atrial flutter with a four to one, four P waves to one QRS conduction pattern. Okay. So we'll take a look at it in just a second. So that'll make more sense. So, um, with atrial flutter or, um, with atrial flutter, the ventricular rate sometimes varies, but is less, definitely less than the atrial rate. The P waves will look again, sawtooth or like shark's fins. The PR interval is not measurable because there's not a QRS for every P, all right? The QRS complex should be normal still within uh, less than 0.10 seconds. And it's uh, an ectopic pacemaker, they call it. It can be also valvular heart disease, hypertension, and heart failure, both of which uh, modules we went over last week. So what are one of the uh, arrhythmias that can follow hypertension and heart failure? Um, it's uh, it's atrial flutter. So here's what it looks like. Let me grab my pen real quick so we could see. So here we have a uh, sawtooth pattern. Okay. One, two, three, it looks like four before this QRS complex. Okay, so basically four or three. Before um, this QRS complex. Okay, so is this a QR? I mean, obviously this is a QRS, but again, like I mentioned earlier, it goes P wave to a positive inflection here. Okay, then a deflection, then back up to the isoelectric line. So really this is an RS, but we will still call it a QRS, okay? And again, it's a, it seems to be a repeating pattern of a three to one conduction pattern. Uh, and again, this is just classic, classic, uh, atrial flutter, okay? It's very recognizable. Now, as the, uh, as the, uh, you know, if there's three to one, they, they, they tend to call it trigeminy. And if it's two to one, they call it bigeminy. Once it starts happening consistently, it becomes more dangerous. So it's something that we want to report immediately, okay? If it's consistent. And of course, if the patient's presenting with signs and symptoms. Now, atrial fib, this is classic. Uh, tons of your admitted patients are going to have AFib as part of their comorbidities or new onset of AFib as their admitting diagnosis. The, the classic way to recognize this is that it's grossly irregular. Okay. You, you fibrillation means like essentially what it means is quivering of one of the chambers. Now, atrial fibrillation is basically quivering of the atrium. So, they're not fully contracting and relaxing, but they're in this quivering state that is um, potentially a very dangerous thing because if it's not ejecting all the blood that's in that chamber in the atrium in this instance, it has the it has the probability of becoming static. And of course, we know that when blood becomes static, it begins to clot. So then sometimes the the heart will spontaneously go back, you know, convert and go back into a normal rhythm. And then if with one strong contraction it'll it'll shoot out that that clot in there so that that can be dangerous that's why people on afib sometimes are on uh, blood thinners there okay um so the rhythm is grossly irregular as we'll soon see when we take a look at the picture here 
the atrial rate can be anywhere from 400 beats per minute or more. That's amazing, but you can't even quantify it really because when you look at it, it just looks like a squiggly line in between the QRS complexes because there's so many, you know, uh, atrial uh, excitatory pulse impulses going on. Okay, and they all look different. They don't look the same. Okay, so again, it's like a quivering of the atrium in this in this instance. The ventricular rate will vary. So when we when we pull out our calipers or our finger method or whatever we're doing, and we're mapping out the R to arch for checking for regularity, it's going to be irregular. Uh, of course, the ventricular rate is going to be less than the atrial rate, but know that most likely you're not going to be able to count the atrial rate. It's going to vary tremendously. Okay. Uh, the P waves are going to be regular and wave deflection. Uh, PR interval is not measurable, obviously, because there's not, there's too many P waves and not enough, uh, P waves to, uh, QRS complexes that actually correlate to even count that. The QRS complex should still be normal, however. Okay. So this is again, QRS complex we know is ventricular contraction or ventricular depolarization. Okay. Um, this can be due to ectopic pacemaker in the atria. The ventricular rate is less than 100. It's controlled AFib. So this is, again, is important to remember. Um, is it controlled AFib? We'll have to see if the rate is under 100 for, for a ventricular rate. If the ventricular rate is greater than 100, it's called AFib with rapid ventricular response or uncontrolled AFib. Okay. Rapid ventricular response, RVR. Okay. You're going to hear that term more as the, as the semester continues. So here's a pic, a quick picture of it. Um, let me just grab a writing device here. And I just want to show you. Oop, here we go. So you see these squigglies in between the QRS. Okay. So it's a bunch of little P waves firing erratically, quivering essentially. Okay. And we see R to R. Pull this up real quick so you see how short this r to r is compared to this r to r well right here so um you see that you don't even have to even break out your calipers to realize that this doesn't you know this has no regularity in terms of r to r okay here again is a close-up view so you see that quivering of the atrium this r to r here compared to this R to R here is very different compared to this one. And again, we know that we have, um, you know, less than three small boxes from R to R to make it to constitute it as regular. So right away, we know that this is not regular. So again, it's grossly irregular. Uh, there's too many P waves or squigglies in between the QRS complexes. And, uh, yeah, it's just the different components that we discussed in the slide previous to this. Okay, now we're getting to the lethal rhythms. Okay, these are things that are uh, emergent conditions, um, life-threatening. The first thing we're going to look at is the ST elevated myocardial infarction or STEMI. Um, this is a classic, classic uh, um, picture of what's called tombstoning. Okay, so if you've ever heard that to that term before, so again, let's let's just kind of draw our isoelectric line. Okay, gotta get my pen to work here. Let's pull a different color out. Maybe that'll give us more, uh, a little better luck here. All right, it's not wanting to work for me, but anyway, you get the picture. Elect isoelectric line, iso meaning same electric line. Uh, we want all of our components of our, our deflections, electrical deflections to return back to this isoelectric line. Okay. So what we have is potentially a P right here. Okay. First negative deflection is the Q. Okay. And then it we have our R, okay, and then negative deflection down, and then it goes to a T wave that's elevated off the isoelectric line, okay, 
it's elevated way off the isoelectric line. So because of this, it's called ST elevation, okay? The S to the T elevation, okay? So the negative deflection here and then the T wave, the T wave there is nowhere near the isoelectric line, which is down here, okay? So the reason they call it tombstoning, and this is, this is a classic myocardial infarction, MI heart attack. This is Mona immediately. If you're not a cardiac cath center, if you're not a cardiac center, then this patient needs to, sh to be shipped out immediately. Um, they need to be put on, you know, crash card immediately at the bedside, uh, placed on that, uh, defibrillator monitor. Um, you're going to give Mona again. That's morphine, oxygen, nitro, and, uh, aspirin. Okay. So, um, class, the, the reason they call it tombstoning, and if my pen will work here, is because it, you know, kind of, loosely resembles the uh, shape of a tombstone, okay? All right, the next slide here, we're gonna be looking at ischemia. Okay, and this is, uh, we know that it's ischemia because we're gonna see ST depression, okay? So just like in the last the last slide we saw um, the S wave, right? The S wave again. Let's mark out our isoelectric line. Okay, hopefully that populates in just a second. I don't know if it will. But yeah, there we go. So here we go. So this really doesn't have a classic uh, Q, but it has the R. Okay, and it comes down. And right when it starts to drop under that isoelectric line, it becomes an S. So the S to the T, okay, is, is off the isoelectric line. It's lower than the isoelectric line, as you can see. Okay. And then I just want to um, draw a little arrow to that depressed line there. Okay, so you can see this line right there is depressed all underneath the isoelectric line. So what does ST depression mean? It means ischemia, a lack of oxygenated blood, okay? So that's called ST depression. All right, so this we're going to treat symptomatically. We're going to reduce the workload of the heart. Um, you know, we're going to give a call out to the doc. We're going to make sure we're doing our 12 lead EKG. If we recognize it on that three or five lead EKG in the first place. All right. So that's, uh, imagery for, um, ST depression. The absolute lethal rhythms are these next three. These next three rhythms are true medical emergencies, crash car, not the ST. MI is not, it really is, and it should be, I should have put in the last part with these. However, these ones are going to lead to uh, cardiac arrest, almost certainly, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at them. The first is ventricular tachycardia, and as you can see, the only visible structure is a ventricular uh, uh, QRS sort of complex, okay? That's just rapid it's got to be over 100 beats per minute and it almost always will be and it follows this real traditional pattern just just like that okay the uh, thing about this is that you may see it develop all right you may see your patient was in some sort of normal or semi-normal rhythm okay q r s and then t and then all of a sudden it starts in this rhythm here. Well, when that happens, when you see it start and you see it end, that's called a paroxysmal run of VTAC. And it will be considered VTAC if you have one, two, oh goodness. Uh, if you have three of these complexes, okay? You have to have at least three to, to constitute it as a run of VTAC. All right, again, 
The first thing that we're going to do is we're not going to trust the monitor per se. We're going to go in and check on the patient immediately. Say, sir, are you okay? Are you all right? If he's unconscious or he's not uh, responding, we check pulse. We, 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 uh, start CPR. We, we call out. We say, Hey, we need help in here. You push the code blue button. But the, the, the main thing is to get some, um, uh, compressions going to get circulation, circulation going until we can get the, defibrillator on board and shock it and hopefully um, it'll convert okay so this is a shockable rhythm a pulseless if it's pulseless it's a shockable rhythm okay um, if they go unconscious and they're in this it's almost certain you're gonna establish if there's a pulse or not and then start CPR call for help get crash cart there the faster uh, we can get uh, defibrillated the the better our chances are Okay, because essentially what the defibrillator will do is it'll reset the heart. It'll give it a, give it a chance to reset. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the uh, next shockable rhythm, which is ventricular fibrillation or V-fib. Okay, in this in this instance, this is absolutely uh, a shockable rhythm um, essentially what's going on here is the ventricular chambers are just quivering just like atrial fibrillation however when when your ventricular chambers are quivering you know you're not getting any cardiac output so it's certain it's cardiac arrest essentially and you need to start CPR immediately if uh, get the crash cart and the defibrillator on board as soon as possible you never leave your patients when, when they're in these rhythms. You call out for help, you push the code blue button, and you establish, you know, after you've established uh, unresponsiveness and started uh, um, chest compressions, okay? So um, this is, again, uh, life-threatening, um, and we need to get a defibrillator on board as soon as possible. So uh, the only variation for this is that um, sometimes it's a coarse V-fib, sometimes it's like subtle, very subtle, you know, and then sometimes it's kind of like, um, like a, just like this, you know, which is a, a coarse V-fib in a, in a uh, fine V-fib, I guess, I don't know. But either way, it's just, it's, you know, you can tell that there's no real structures that look the same. Um, there's no discernible P waves or QRS complexes, so you know this is VFID. All right. So the the next and last rhythm is probably the easiest, and it's asystole. Okay, this means an absence of a heart rate, absence of a heart rhythm. Uh, this is like basically what we um, think of asystole we think it's we call it flatlining right but sometimes that's not always the case sometimes we'll see like this is you know we we're just talking about v-fib this is v-fib to asystole okay um and this is pulseless electrical activity so basically it looks like little p waves with no qrs complexes following um sometimes you can have a normal heart rate or semi-normal let's say and then they're unresponsive and you go to establish a carotid pulse or femoral pulse a central pulse and and there's no pulse that's called pulseless electrical activity so um the heart will continue to try to generate beats you know even even it's the last thing to go it's the last absolute thing to go so um still trying to you know, engage backup mechanisms, you know, in the electrical pathway, but it's just not enough. Just like agonal rhythms, you know, I mean, agonal respirations, they're, your body still tries to breathe, but it's not conscious breathing and, and it's, uh, it's not enough to sustain life or even, uh, you know, help at all. So, and I don't care how many movies you've seen where they, the patient's been in a systole or TV shows, it's not a shockable rhythm. A systole is not a shockable rhythm. Okay.
So again, just remember to follow the five step plan each and every time. Practice, practice, practice. I want you to know common causes for each of the rhythms that are not normal sinus. Okay, so I didn't really touch base on it, but this is something I want you to know. Okay, um, I want you to know potential treatments for the rhythms that are not normal sinus. So uh, bradycardia, for example, if it's sinus bradycardia and they're asymptomatic, chances are we're just going to observe. We're going to support with some supplemental O2, and we're going to we're going to monitor the patient. Uh, but if it's symptomatic, we may need to engage some atropine and uh, or some uh, external pacing. If they don't have a pacemaker, some external pacing. Um, okay. Uh, that's just an example. And I so I want you to know these things uh, for testing purposes and for just baseline knowledge. Uh, this is general nursing knowledge for the med search telemetry force. So I definitely want you guys to... Uh, dedicate some time to this okay so without further ado that's um, my lecture for the ekg recognition and basic ekg patterns and i'll see you in class thank you